Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Small Business School is made possible by support from IBM. We're not just for big business anymore. At our website, discover how technology can move your business forward. When it's your business, everything matters. IBM. And the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. There's no wait at the post office in your own office. USPS.com is waiting for you. Hi, I'm Hattie Bryant. In the last 10 years, small business owners have created over 20 million new jobs. On the path to creating work, thousands have revitalized historic business districts like the two you'll meet today. Richard Stanley and Joe Wasserman are classic entrepreneurs. Rather than looking at a problem and walking away, they look at a problem and come up with a solution. They did not say, why doesn't somebody do something? They took the bull by the horn and put ideas into action. Now you'll learn how one business brought new life to an old downtown. <laughs> The town of Great Barrington, set in the beautiful Berkshires of western Massachusetts, had seen better days. There was a period when downtown was, had a lot of vacancies and it was very, very dead. Businessmen like Richard Stanley and Joe Wasserman envisioned improvement, and now everyone is enjoying what they've built. One adult and two children for Armageddon. Yes. This property here had been abandoned for a number of years and there was a lot of rotting and falling apart and the roof was peeling back. The two combined 30 years each of similar. business experience to build their movie theater. Basically what we do is we run it through and we just make sure that there are no mistakes. If there are, we cut the, the, the film and then we repiece it so it's perfect. Un Jung Lim threads up the next movie. I guess I just assume it comes from Hollywood Perfect. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I thought in the beginning, and uh, the process does take, it does take quite a long time. The triplex opened November 11, 1995. Richard spent most of his career in the hair salon business, which he ultimately built into a successful chain. After selling out, he moved to Great Barrington. Were you thinking that you're going to chill out and relax? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I came up here the first year, I played golf and had a great time. But towards the end, started getting antsy. And I had been investigating owning real estate. My uncle was a developer. And that always sort of interested me. I never quite knew how to do it or how to get started. I, even, even while I was in New York and I lived in areas where there were brownstones and brownstones being renovated, and that had always been my fantasy. I wanted to be in the real estate business. So I did come up here and started dabble in it. And it was the 80s, and it was a pretty go-go time here. And I just sat around and watched uh, people buy real estate because it didn't feel right to me. Having gone through business school, actually a few years before I had come up here, to me it was just a bunch of numbers. If the numbers didn't add up, don't do it. And, and you, real weren't, estate, you weren't getting the right numbers no, when you were and, adding. And uh, real estate became the bigger fool theory up here, and it, I suspect nationwide. Meaning the way you're going to make money is not because there's an economic return on owning this piece of uh, this asset. Mm -hmm. It's because you're going to convince somebody that it's going to go up even more after they get it. And I didn't buy anything. Mm -hmm. um, I finally bought my first uh, significant building, which is adjacent to where we are now. And it was a huge building that uh, was pretty well run down. And I can envision what it could look like. 
All of these fronts were all aluminum. None of them were look like what they look like now. So you just peeled off the, the facades? The facades and, and discovered all kinds of interesting things underneath it. When I went inside and we started um, taking the paneling off the wall, I discovered a couple of more gorgeous arches in there. And that building really is what hooked me. Unfortunately, the back was a seedy parking area mm -hmm. with a huge burned out building. Mm. And um, try to think about what could, you know, what could we do with this? This is Railroad Street we're about to walk up and my no, peers that here. grew up in this area, uh, their parents would never let them even walk on Railroad Street. It used to be bars and uh, billiard parlors. Now they won't even permit a billiard parlor. <laughs> that's right. That's exa that's exactly uh, some friend had told right me, here. mutual friend had told me, he mentioned Richard to me, he said that you know, we probably would have a lot of interests we could share. Joe ran his own architectural firm in New York City. We started talking. He just said to me, you know, I've been thinking about a piece of land behind a building I own in the middle of Great Barrington, and I don't know if you'd have any interest in it. And uh, yes, this is exactly the piece of kind of land that makes sense to me, to have a big underutilized, underdeveloped piece of land that relates, could relate well, didn't at all. Uh, to um, the rest of, the, of, a, uh, of a small downtown. And at the same time, I certainly you know, was aware, having been in the hair salon business, of how malls operated. And what was the real virtue of a mall, aside from a place the kids to hang out? And it was the idea that there was a critical mass there. There was an overall identity. And I started thinking about, well, that's really what a town is all about, a small downtown. Mm -hmm. It took us a long time to figure out what to do here, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the movie theaters were, we came to uh, quite late in that mm -hmm. process. And I guess it was Joe that came up with the idea, how about a movie theater? I said, a movie theater? Do we really want to run a movie theater? You know, what do we know about it? Well, we started working on it, and uh, Joe did, did a lot of the early numbers work, but we did show by show trying to figure out how many people would come and what our gross would be, and then, you know, started adding expenses up. What did you do, stand out in front of the competitor down the road and count how many people were walking in every night? We guessed. We really guessed. We didn't talk to anybody. Oh, my gosh. So we got all our financing together. The local banks were great. They worked with us. Partners. But that happened because you've already been successful with the front building. You've made a hit out of that. You've cleaned up that front street. You've built this parking lot, and the banker said, okay, now, guys. The reason I think this is an interesting place to stop is somebody's sitting here saying, I want to build something. I want to do something. How do I convince the bankers? The way you go to any bank or any funding source is with a business plan. And we had a reasonable business plan. We had even built a model of what, what we were going to do. Um, and I think the bank also, being not too far away, believed in wanting to revitalize the downtown. This had gone from a strictly second home uh, community to more and more people moving up here and doing business out of, out of this area. Like you. and Like, like me. And Joe. Exactly. This was uh, a very grungy building in very bad repair. You can see that this is the new building, built essentially on the footprint of the old building. So I think that uh, it's quite a transformation. <laughs> I think there's a very good fit between uh, having movie theaters downtown. First thing we don't, uh, uh, a good synergy because our parking requirements are mostly in the evening when theirs is, are, are greatly diminished or non-existent. It's a very good fit in that regard. And it, there's no question we're feeding, people come downtown to go to movies and go to restaurants and so on. So we're bringing some nightlife to a town that would have closed up and been very dead at night. The triplex is a boutique, one location with three screens. Uh, two for the opposite of sex, please. Just as any small shop avoids carrying the same items one can find in the big department stores, the triplex avoids running the films moviegoers could find at the big chains. A uh, year and a half down the road, we realized that 
a large operator like we had managing uh, this theater wasn't really in touch as much as we would like with the community and wasn't doing the kind of programming that we thought was appropriate for this community. Uh, in other words, you really were operating more as the realtor, <laughs> the developer, the realtor, and letting them run the business as opposed to you being the to yes. running the business. Yes. And that, that piece of truth could transfer to other industries, other businesses. If you want to put the puzzle pieces together in place, you can. Let someone else run it. You don't need to own anything to be successful in business. You need to control whatever you need to control. And really, in a way, that's always been what business has been about. People have tried to control every element of their business. But there are different ways to do it. The old model was if you own everything, you can really control it and big companies thought that was the only way to get good quality control, get pr good production control, was to own everything, and you could tell everybody what to do, and things would flow downhill. And certainly that's not the model for, t for, for the 90s or going forward. We were pretty hands-off initially, and then we just felt we weren't uh, maximizing the potential of this theater and that uh, the audience, we weren't feeding the audience that we thought we had. So when we had an opportunity to break our, our contract with them, we elected to do so. I don't think they were unhappy to have it happen because we were a thorn in their side. Mm -hmm. Small theater and they were expanding rapidly and they needed us like they needed, mm -hmm. you know, a hole in their head. So bigger is not always better? Oh, absolutely. Bigger is not always better. Smarter is always better. Okay. And, and more targeted. You got to know your customer. You got to be in the marketing business, not in the sales business. So you and Joe don't say, oh, we'll choose the movies now. No. First thing we do before we decided to split the blanket was shop around for a booker that understood, would have an understanding of this market. Is and a booker the same as a management company? Not at all. Okay. A booker is simply somebody that buys movies for your theater. Okay, so you made a decision, you and Joe, that you didn't need a management company anymore. You would get a booker, and then you would hire somebody like Alex. To manage this. I do pretty much uh, everything. If it's um, scheduling the crew, if it's ordering supplies, if it's doing final reports, or if it's popping corn. How did they get you to come to work here? Um, no, I, I saw an ad in the paper. It sounded like an interesting job. Um, I did come from an arts background. This is something that is close to arts, mm -hmm. but um, offers a little bit more um, business sides mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's, it, it is about you know, making, making the money at the end of the day. She isn't here all the time. She does take some time off. She has good assistant managers who cover for her. Her, but she's, she's a vital force here. The accolades that all of us get on the street from, and that's interesting about being in a community of this size, is that uh, you talk to your customers. They see you in the local luncheonette or wherever, and they'll let you know. You can't whether hide. You can't hide here. Absolutely not. Richard Stanley and Joe Wasserman tried to quit. They came separately to Great Barrington to relax, retire, and perhaps fiddle around real estate or whatever caught their fancy. They met while attending a town meeting, and, as entrepreneurs will do, they talked about their dreams for improving Great Barrington's historic business district. Now you see what became of their first meeting. Richard and Joe couldn't retire, and no one should have a goal to retire. Sure, you want to change. Sure, you need a new challenge. But we're all sick and tired of hearing the AARP bragging about being the biggest association in the world and about being the largest advocacy group in Washington. When people who don't work claim to have the biggest voice, something's very wrong. All of us at Small Business School are baby boomers. No one here thinks about retiring. It's not good for people not to have work. And it's not good for the country for our most experienced individuals to leave the workforce. The great thing about working for yourself is no one can make you quit. And certainly, no one can make you join the AARP. We have studied a number of way past retirement age entrepreneurs. We've learned a lot from them and from Richard and Joe. But I think the greatest lesson is they are all smart enough not to retire. At smallbusinessschool.org, there is self-help study for people who want to start a business and for those who want to grow the business they have. 
To learn more about this episode, choose the overview. You can read every word you're hearing today when you choose the transcript and go deeper with the case study. There's streaming video and access to interactive study guides throughout the site. I was born and raised here, right in a nearby town in Stockbridge. Marty Salvador now, grew up in the Berkshires and actually Kennedy. posed right for this head. Norman Rockwell painting. I'm right in the middle here behind John Kennedy. So did all your family recognize you? Oh uh, yeah, they still do. <laughs> Marty has been in the insurance business in Great Barrington for 30 years. Um, they, Richard and Joe, have done uh, some things to regenerate interest in some of the older buildings, places in town that were being let go or run down and created uh, some real activity and interest and this was really important in their case because it was in the core area of town, mm -hmm. center of town, which, uh, you know, if that dies, then the rest of the body dies with it and, and I think what they've done has been really great. You've built this, you've, you've renovated this space, you've created something wonderful, now what next? Oh, it's simple. This terrace is still not working very well. When good weather, there should be a crowd here. It ought to be popping. This yeah. is where mm -hmm. it, the action should be, and it's mm -hmm. not happening. The first time I came to the triplex, I saw this shiny surface, and mm -hmm. it shocked me. Only because I was in this mm -hmm. old town, and I hadn't seen any of the modern mm -hmm. part of it. Yeah. I mean, I love it. I, I do. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you this question, Joe. Do you think, um, did you have a little bit of conflict with folks wanting to do something modern? Well, if you look around here at this uh, backs of all these existing buildings, yes, uh, there are no great buildings here. This is uh, uh, <laughs> it is exactly what it is. The backs of, uh, of old and buildings. Uh, we weren't. I didn't feel any uh, great need to conform to an architecture to an ambiance. Mm -hmm. There was none, and I and. Uh, Back in colonial times, we did not make movie theaters with That's right. blank walls and black boxes. That's right. No, I love so it. So we I'm had just to find an surprised. expression that uh, that we thought was commensurate mm -hmm. and uh, you know that flows that made sense and without imposing what I call a phony colony look. Phony uh, colony. There's uh, no phony colony here. Why does this building that I'm sitting in that you designed? Why does it feel so good to me? Oh, Why I don't know if it does feel good. It though. does. Yeah. It does. I'm, I like being in here. I yeah. like it. And I'm going to guess the light has a lot to do with it. I don't know. I'm not an architect. I just know when I came in, I felt good. I, you know, what are the intangible things? The, the, the scale, the character, the shaping of the space, the color. I don't know, the views out. There's a lot of things that goes into making a, you know, shaping a space. And, and, and uh, I think this extension of the plaza is that you're not in the parking lot, that you're a bit elevated from it and so on, uh, is very helpful. And uh, that it's a very compact plan, actually. Uh, it may feel rather spacious out here, but you, it, it, there's almost not a room to put an extra shoebox into this building. I mean, it's very. It's very tightly worked out. I had never done a movie theater or theaters at all before, so this was a new experience for me. If, if a person is good in business, are they good in all business? Well, I think if somebody's a good entrepreneur, I would say by definition they could do anything. Okay. So what does it take specifically, what do you need to know to run a movie theater that you had to learn that you didn't know? Well, the only, in my mind, the only thing different about a movie theater that's really different is understanding the product flow. I mean, you still have the same issues that if you show this movie and nobody comes, well, boy, I guess it's the wrong movie. And you gotta you know, figure out what about the movie didn't work. And conversely, um, if movies do work, I'm always trying to figure out why do they work. Uh, in my mind, I don't think of this as a movie theater. I look at this as a community asset. So, so far you've got five years in this. Five years. And you haven't yeah. taken any money out yet. No, no. And we have obviously money invested here. Mm -hmm. So I would say, um, but I think this year we'll see a little bottom line and next year I think it'll be, begin to be reasonable. All right. Yeah. So that's what What's I'm a good bottom line? I. We haven't taken any salary for our work either. Mm -hmm. I took a fee for the design of this, 
building, but that's the only only fees that we've taken out. Uh, Richard has taken a small management fee, I think. That's about it. Do you think it's important for an entrepreneur to have a mission that's bigger than just selling a ticket? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's what makes entrepreneurs go away. Um, you know, entrepreneurs more than likely die doing what they're doing. They don't stop and sit around and play golf. And you've got to have a love and an enthusiasm for it. Otherwise, you can't constantly search. As soon as you're satisfied, you're no longer an entrepreneur. If you always want to know why or how to do this better or bigger or different or whatever, that's what keeps people going as an entrepreneur. At least certainly that keeps me going and the things I've observed about people, entrepreneurs. Uh, very rarely do entrepreneurs do only one thing. That's, uh, you know, they're always doing this, that, and the other. I like the broad picture. I like, I'm very hands-on in the design phase. I've never uh, run a firm where I turned over the design to, you know, young associates and because that's what it's all about, mm -hmm. in, in essence, for me as an architect. When it finally comes down to it, I want to be the shaper, the maker. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us at the beginning envisioned totally what it would be like when it got finished. Oh, come on, Richard. Go look at my original sketch. <laughs> it's has. almost identical to what we ended up with. Right? Huh? Moving the house. We knew that he would contribute the land. No, yeah. no. We had to get all We knew spaces. that we would buy the railroad street building. Uh -huh. Yeah, all of that was preordained. <laughs> if you're ever in the neighborhood, visit Great Barrington. Shop, eat, and go to the movies. Marketing advisor John Wargo offers a money-saving idea. Richard and Joe are really good marketers. They run ads consistently in the newspaper because they have to compete with the other uh, movie theater in town. They have to say, well, these are the movies that are showing. But what could they do that wouldn't cost them an arm and a leg to get more people in the door? Well, I think the combination of advertising, you're going to use newspapers, they're going to get a broad circulation uh, on the newspaper. They could supplement that by doing geographical targeting and by that I mean what they can do is draw a line around their movie theater, draw a line around the retail establishments, they can go to a letter shop and what they can do is they can get all of the addresses, all of the carrier routes within a three mile radius, five mile radius, whatever they have found is their market, they could now supplement their newspaper advertising with a direct mail program. Mm -hmm. And the combination of the two will, will really work well for them. Okay, and I don't have to know everyone's name. Right. No, you really don't have to know anybody's name because uh, there's an industry out there that has uh, addresses. Now, what you can do, you can be very, very creative with the name. What do you mean? Well, you can call movie lovers. You mean you address, it, address movie it, movie lovers. Right. Don't say John Wargo or Hattie Bryant, right. say movie right. lovers. You can say movie lovers. You can put whatever you want to put in there. You might want to test a couple of mailings to see which one draws best. The important thing is that when you go to the letter shop, you get the correct address. Okay. Now, what do I need to give them in this piece of mail? Do I need to give them free popcorn, a discount? That's where the offer comes in, right? The offer. Free always works. I free mean, always works. It always works. <laughs> I mean, if you put in the mailing uh, free popcorn, uh, you do two things. One, you're going to draw traffic, but second of all, you can measure your response rates. All right. It gives you a clear idea of how well that mailing worked. Then the next time you do a mailing, code it differently or get something else free and see which one pulls. And then you begin to see what really attracts this audience. What bonus works the best for so me? So you're saying one week give free popcorn, the next week discount for kids under 13, the next week yeah. free coke, right. and then see what works. Make it exciting. Okay. And then see which one works the best. Now, my only drawback for me on this occupant saturation mail is someone might look at, oh, it's junk mail. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as junk mail. Mail is valuable to the reader if the message is relevant. As okay. long as the message is relevant. So if I love popcorn, right. this is right. gold. Ah, you got two things. If you love movies and you love popcorn. So it's not just one offering. So it is gold. 
Richard and Joe started a new business after cashing out of other ventures. If you've cashed out and are now bored and you want a little encouragement to get going again, come to our website and revisit with Joe and Richard. There is a case study guide, the entire transcript, an overview with links to many other stories about people who are enjoying life at work over 65. Everyone at Small Business School hopes you'll never retire. We think retirement's an obsolete idea. We hope you'll keep finding new ways to contribute. How can we get better if the wisest among us are at the golf course? We'll see you next time. Small Business School is made possible by support from IBM. We're not just for big business anymore. At our website, discover how technology can move your business forward. When it's your business, everything matters. IBM. And the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. There's no wait at the post office in your own office. USPS.com is waiting for you. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.